In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. People like you come to church for a variety of reasons. Different things bring people to church. Just want to highlight a couple of them here. I'd say probably the most common one is they're here to make a connection with the divine, with God. That's fairly obvious. Some people come to be equipped for the faith that they possess. Some people come because they believe Christ has led them to a particular church community. This one, or if you have another church community, perhaps you're one of, uh, that's one of the reasons that you attend a particular church. People come to church to find hope and find meaning. Some people come to church because that's just what we do on Sunday morning. This is becoming a smaller and smaller group of people. But, it, nevertheless, there are some who still come because it has been their lifelong habit. Right? Some people are here under duress. They don't want to be here. Right? Occasionally, you just are, you come along because somebody wants you to come along with them and you may or may not want to be in church that day. When I was a rector of St. David's across town back in the 90s, I was uh, preaching one Sunday. It was over uh, the Christmas holidays. And uh, I noticed that one guy, when he came up for communion, had an earpiece in. And I thought, oh, the Secret Service must be here today for some unknown reason. And uh, so I find out after the service, he's been listening to the Cowboy game. And they were in the playoffs. So the following year, I thought, I'm going to open with that. And so I did in the sermon. And lo and behold, he was back again that year. Of course, Cowboys probably weren't. But he told me that, oh yeah, that was me last year. And I thought, oh well. So much for that uh, anonymity. But he was there under a little bit of duress, but he was there. And he even got a mention in the sermon. <laughs> there are many reasons why people come to church. And I think one of the reasons some people come is to get a glimpse or a strengthening for what it means to live, as the colic said today, into the liberty of that abundant life found in Christ. That's what we prayed for. It's in your bulletin this morning. So I like to think that uh, people come to see a little bit about the abundant life and how that might tie in or even understand what it is. Because most people say abundant life. Yeah, what is it and how do I get it? What is it and how do I get it? In our context, as Christian worshipers, it comes with a qualifier. And the qualifier is in the collect today. It's not just any old abundant life that you might want to define. It's an abundant life within the framework of Jesus' life. What he did and what he said. Now, Catherine and I have been watching a docu-series on Apple TV called Transcendence. I'm not sure if any of you all have seen it. It's two seasons of five episodes each, and they obviously have a title, a different title for each one of these series. And we watched one this week uh, whose title was, Whose Goals Are You Chasing? Whose Goals Are You Chasing? And, and this is not a religious uh, docu-series, it's just a docu-series. Whose goals are you chasing? And in this documentary, they interviewed a lot of people who had set for themselves a lot of lofty goals. And they reached them. And they weren't all that satisfied after they got there. 
So uh, obviously the theme, Whose Gold Are You Chasing, emerged as the title because they spent years sometimes chasing these and then found out that really wasn't the happiness that they were seeking. So what is the abundant life? They certainly wouldn't describe their life as abundant if you get to that point and you're still feeling lacking in some way. So what is the abundant life? For me to answer that question, I start with a premise. That God, and the premise is this, God's reign arches over all of life, not segments of it. So everything in our life is under God's reign. All aspects of our life. And our lives are pretty darn complicated, right? We've got a lot of things going on at any given time. Let me just give you one example. As I go through my example here, think about your own life, all right? I am a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a friend, a colleague, a priest, a bishop. I don't relate to all of these different people in these orbits in the same way. My kids didn't really care about my wonderful authority as the bishop. Right? I related to them at home in a different way. It's no wonder we all have multiple personality disorder. Just think of how many different ways you relate to people every day. Right? So the abundant life can't just be in one of these areas. It has to permeate everything, doesn't it? I mean, the Lord's way has to be connected in these, all these segments. Not just a couple of them, not just one of them. We are all part of an interconnected web of human relationships. And as card-carrying members of the human race, we all have an interest in it doing well. And so as we think about how we balance our life, I want to use a metaphor for a balanced life portfolio. Most of us, with, if you have a retirement account or something, you know what we're talking about when we say a balanced portfolio. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. You want good things spread out across your entire portfolio. So let's take that for a minute and apply it to a balanced life portfolio. And I want to mention this. I want to mention five things in this regard. You can take any of one of them. Let's start with faith. The, the five are this. Faith, um, uh, family, friends, meaningful work, and service to others. Faith. Faith helps me make sense of the world I live in. It also baffles me sometimes in that same world. But the idea of faith is you have a framework in which to understand your own, our own life together as the family of God and interconnected with one another, your faith. When Jesus heals Bartimaeus of blindness in the 10th chapter of Mark, he ha the, the story ends with this statement. Your, Jesus tells Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. And when I hear that, I want to interpret that to lead me to a question. How does my faith make me well? It's not just restricted to physical illness. It is a spiritual reflection. So there's one. How does my faith make me well? Family. These are relationships we don't generally choose. Right? 
They're foisted upon us. I have a friend who likes to joke, except I don't know how much of a joke it is. What I don't like about the holidays is I have to leave my loved ones and spend time with my family. <laughs> so these relationships may not be ones you choose, but they should be ones you can count on. Ones you can count on. Because people in your family need you. You need them. Is there some area in your life portfolio section of family that needs some healing, some grace, some reconciliation, some strengthening? All right, friends. Number three in our balanced portfolio of life, friends. Friends are generally relationships that we do choose, presumably. If you, if you don't have these people, they're not bringing you much joy, right? That's what your friends do. You enjoy spending time with them. So friends are an important part of our portfolio. In the 15th chapter of John, Jesus tells his disciples, I have called you servants, but now I call you friends. I think that's the goal Christ has for every one of us, a desire to be in friendship, in friendship. We can count on our friends. Christ can count on us to be witnesses and partners in the ministry that we share together. Four, m meaningful work. There are a lot of people that don't like their job. You may be one of them. But every job has dignity. Every job has worth. So wherever you are in your job, and whatever you consider your job, even if you're retired and you have something else you're doing, remember Proverbs, which says... Commit your work to the Lord. Commit your work to the Lord. Because all work has dignity. All labor. Service to others. Number five in our balanced portfolio. Jesus said this repeatedly in one way or another. If you want to be great, serve others. That was the message. A message of Christ. Meaningful service to others. Today in the gospel, after Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, it tells us she got up and served them. Now, if you want to interpret this narrowly, you say, well, of course she did. She's a woman, and that's what they did in those days. <laughs> but I prefer a much deeper, wider interpretation of that. She got up and served after Jesus touched her. When we have an encounter with Christ, the appropriate response is to help Christ serve others. So we're called to service. An interaction with Jesus, best way to write a thank you note is what? Serve others. Serve others. The Lord is always glad when we're doing that. So you've got, that's just five I shared this morning. You might have others. But when any one of these areas in your portfolio is out of balance, you're out of balance, right? They're an interconnected group of things that make up our lives. And so we get stressed. You have a bad day at work, you go home, you're in a bad mood with your family. That's affected, right? You got... Trouble at home might affect your work, your friends. Any number of these things. You know, you, you're too busy, or you're busy, so you don't serve like you want to, and that gets under your skin, because you want to do better, but you just don't see how you're going to dig out from under everything to do it. So all these things are connected. When our children were babies, like I'm sure this was your experience as well. In their crib, when they were just youngsters, 
we put, we attached onto the side of the crib a mobile. You know what I'm talking about? These things with a lot of strings on them and there's little airplanes and colored and balls and different things. So the kids hit them, look at it, start to learn about the world around them. So I used to watch, stand over their crib and watch them do this. And one thing that I learned in that is that if you touch one thing, it puts the whole system in motion, right? And I like to think about that in a balanced life portfolio. If one area is pushed, your whole system is likely to be put into motion. Meaning, you have a bad day at work, you go home, take it out on your family, or whatever. Think of an example. So I, re so I want to remember that in my own life, that these areas of my investment portfolio of a balanced, meaningful, abundant life are connected closely with one another. And I hope you will think about that too. Finally this. The kingdom of God begins in a person's life as a small and perhaps insignificant looking thing. But over time, with a lot of prayer and a lot of faithfulness, it can grow into a mighty force for the kingdom, for the purposes of Christ. So, if you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this. They told me at the 9 o'clock service I dropped my voice so half the people didn't even hear this, so I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> All right? If you want a great life, live for great reasons. That is the abundant life that Jesus is talking about. Amen.